Hey, good morning. Hey, man, so glad you're here. If you are joining us on the other side of a monitor or television, want to just say good morning to you as well. Hey, uh, before we get started, uh, I want to give you guys something because you just saw we're talking about prayer. So I just want to, at the top of uh, this thing, give you guys something to pray about. Uh, we are not vain. Uh, you look at this platform and you're like, wasn't the one before big enough? Uh, yeah, so it was. But uh, we have a high school. I think it's the state orchestra coming in. Kids from all over the state are going to be in this place and they're going to be performing. And, but they're going to be performing in a church. So here's what I want you to pray about. That everybody who would walk through these doors, whether they could articulate it or not, would sense the peace of God. So if you guys would be praying for these kids and families this week as they kind of walk in here, that would be great. Well, we are in our third week of a four-week series that we're calling Circle Maker, which we're focusing on prayer. And in week number one, what we did is we charted the vision and the trajectory of the church, which we're calling Jesus Conversations. Basically, let me just put it in this format. The church is leaving the building. And we're heading out to share Jesus with those in our community. And we're asking everybody to have one more Jesus conversation than they did last year. That's just our goal this year, that everybody in here, 100% of the church, would have one more Jesus conversation, whether it's praying with somebody, whether that's sharing, or whether that's caring for somebody in Jesus' name. That's what we're asking everybody to do. And as I've reflected on this over the past couple weeks, I was thinking about the early church. And if they were to hear me today say, we're going to go outside the church and have 50,000 Jesus conversations, do you know what they would have said to us? Well, duh. Isn't that kind of the whole idea of the church? Yeah. But I just want to be real honest with you guys, and this isn't a soapbox, and this isn't a bully pulpit or anything like that. This isn't made to feel like guilty, but, but here's the trajectory. See, in our Western culture, we've made coming here the church. I just want to remind us, we are the church. And it is our job, it is our mission to gather and then take what God does in here and go outside these walls and share. And it is because that vision is so big, it is because it is a return to what the church is supposed to be, that we have said we are going to start this new year with an emphasis of ratcheting up, of stepping into and stepping up our prayer life. And so last week, we did something that the disciples asked Jesus to do. You see, the disciples who had been praying their entire lives saw something unique about the way Jesus prayed. They saw something unique about the fruit that came from his life and his ministry. They saw something unique in his relationship with God the Father. So what they say? Lord, will you teach me to pray? And he says, yeah, you bet. And if you were here last week, you remember, he said, when you start your prayers, start with the simple word, Father. You see, you, then they had been calling God El Shaddai, Yahweh. Sometimes his, his name was so holy, some of them wouldn't even dare say his name. And so to hear the word Father, it was revolutionary because Jesus is saying we're supposed to relate to God the way a child relates to the Father, confidently, boldly, expectantly. We can come to him with anything and everything and ask him because God relates to us and sees us as his children. And he loves us and he wants to hear from us. And so we said, Lord, teach us to pray. And after Jesus said, start with Father, he simply said, your kingdom come. Come. Well, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. It is a kingdom of peace. It is a powerful kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom. It is a kingdom of life. And so, man, where there is death, God, your kingdom come. Where does death reside? It resides in people far from God. Lord, I pray your kingdom would come in people who are far from you. Man, Lord, I pray your kingdom would come in those anxious parts of our heart. Lord, I pray your kingdom would come in that anger that I struggle with. Lord, I pray for peace. I pray for harmony instead of discord. Lord, I pray your kingdom come in my disbelief. I pray your kingdom would come, your truth would come in my doubt. And so he taught us to pray that way. Well, then this week in community groups, we went from that question 
and we flip the script on everybody. And we were forced to ask a question that God asked Moses back in the book of Numbers. The children of Israel, they're in the desert, they're in that wayward, they're, they're in the wilderness, and they're wondering, they're all crying, they're sick of manna. They're like, you know, Lord, you've been providing for us each and every day, and we're really tired about it. We're really tired of manna. We'd like some, we'd like some beef. We'd like some meat. And Moses is just asking, how are you going to do that? Duh, he's been providing manna every day. Is it going to be too hard to get these dudes some meat? And God asks Moses a question that we wrestled with in our community group this week, which was, is there any limit to my power? That's what God asked Moses. And that's the question that we had to ask this week was, is there any limit to God's power? And so if you miss group or if you're not part of a group yet, go join. Uh, if you're not part of a group yet, just think about that and process that this morning. Is there any limit to God's power? Now, because we're in church, of course we're going to say, well, no. But oftentimes when we answer that question, it's completely based on our circumstances. We all know that there's no limit to God's power, but when we're crying out to him, we're like, Father, I know you can do something about it, but when God's not answering the way we want him to or in the time frame that we want him to, it starts to jack with our feelings. And we start to wonder, man, is there something wrong with me? God, is there something wrong with you? And we start to like doubt that God can do this. Or we start to wonder, like, is God mad at me? And it starts to mess with us a little bit. And I was, I was listening to this podcast. Uh, some of you guys have heard of this, uh, this uh, young lady. Her, her name is Lisa Turkers. She's the uh, president of Proverbs 31 Ministries. And she was talking about this very thing. Is there any limit to God's power? And she had been feeling ill. And then pain came in. And she started to ask God, God, take my pain away. Well, the pain got so intense, it landed her in the hospital. And at some point, she knew that God had the power to. But for some reason, he wasn't. And it started to mess with her answer. And it started to mess with her view of God. And she's like, God, if you're a loving father... I'm a loving parent. I would take care of this for my kid if it was in, if it was in uh, my power to do so. And God, I know it is within your power to take my pain away. Why aren't you doing this? I know that you can do this. And it was just starting to mess with her view of God. Because that's oftentimes we come to that question with what's happening in our lives. Well, the doctor after a couple days came into her room and he said, Lisa, we've finally been able to diagnose the problem. You have a twisted colon. So I want you to know that we're about to take you to surgery, and then over the next few hours, I'm going to be able to fix what's going on, and that pain's going to go away. However, I also know that you're a person of faith, and I know that you've been asking God to take your pain away. Understand this, Lisa. If God would have answered your prayer and your pain would have gone away, I would have sent you home, and you would have died because your colon would have ruptured and it would have killed you. So it looks like God is answering your prayer just in a different way that you thought he was. Her takeaway was this. This is what she says. I think the quote will come up here on the screen. There we go. Nope. That's the question. There we go. God loves me too much to answer my prayer at any other time than the right time and in any other way than the right time way. There is no limit to his power. And if you've been praying for something, if you've been seeking God for something and you're wondering, is there something wrong with me? Or is God not hearing me? Because God knows and because he sees things that we can't see and because his love for you always wants what's best for you, you can believe with 100% certainty that there is no limit to God's power. If you need more evidence, just walk outside because he spoke all of that into existence. From the mind and the mouth of God, it all exists and it all stays in place. And if you would need more proof that there is no limit to God's power, just look around the room with me. Life everywhere, people, 
There is, and he sustains, our breath is in his hands. There is no limit to his power. And if there is no limit to his power, and we're talking about prayer, well, that should tell us something about prayer, which if there's no limit to God's power, there should be no limit to what we pray. And what I'm meaning, what I'm trying to get at when I say this is, is that if God's power is limitless and he gave us the gift of prayer, then that tells me that prayer is powerful. That's not my idea. That's God's idea. Turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 5, please. James chapter 5, James, the brother of Jesus, is going to tell us something where I want to focus our attention today, because oftentimes we come at prayer from a place of weakness and desperation, and we wonder, is God hearing? And James makes this awesome declaration today, and he simply says this. We're just going to look at this one sentence, we're going to talk about it today. He says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and it's effective. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and it's effective. Well, let's look at that word righteous because that is a big word and it's not a word that we typically use, uh, you know, unless maybe your favorite team is the Golden State Warriors and somebody had an awesome dunk and you said, that dunk was righteous. It would be a total misuse of the word, but I get it. Righteousness is just. When you think about just, we think about justice. God is a just judge. And what does he do? What is the job of a judge? To take what is wrong and to make it right. That's the job of a judge, to take what is wrong and make it right. Righteousness, that's where righteousness comes from. Well, through Jesus Christ, God has made us the complete work, the whole work of Jesus' death and resurrection makes us right with God. He has taken what is wrong with us, our sin condition, and he has justified us. He has made us right with him, and he's making us right with people. So, it, so therefore, through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit at work in us, we are the righteousness of God. Meaning if you have a personal relationship with God this morning through his son Jesus Christ, you are his righteousness. You are the righteousness of God. And here's the beauty when it comes to prayer. Let's put James 5.16 up there. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Your prayers are powerful and effective because you are the righteousness of God and you're tapping into his power. He's made himself accessible to all of us. So the next time you don't know what to do, you've got these paths in front of you and you don't know which way to go, James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Lord, would you show me which way to go? And because his power is limitless, you can expect that he cares about that and he'll want to answer. The next time you are desperate, the hurt exists, you don't not, not only do you not know which way to go, you are desperate for God. The hurt that exists in your life, what should you do? I would remind you in that moment, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective because the one who we are praying to, his power is limitless. Ask for his peace. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding from Philippians, will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The next time you are so excited, you are so anticipating what is heading your way, that your heart is full of joy, what should we do? Remember, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Because the one that we are praying to, his power is limitless. And we 
we say, God, thank you for the good gifts that you have brought my way. There are people here today who are missing out on praying powerful and effective prayers because you're not praying. The next time God brings an opportunity to pray, step in that with the full confidence that if you are righteous, that if God has made you right through Christ Jesus, your prayers are powerful and your prayers are effective and God hears and God knows. Let me tell you a story about a powerful and effective prayers, not one. This past Christmas Eve, while we were all packing in here for Christmas Eve services, while we were all getting ready to celebrate our Christmas with our families and with our friends, there was a family down in Colorado whose little girl was sick. So mom loaded up her little girl named Charlie, put her in the back of the SUV, buckled her in, and was on her way to Instacare when a careless driver smashed into their SUV. It took the life of her mother, but God in his goodness spared her little daughter. When the people showed up on the scene, when the medics showed up on the scene, they had to rush her to Denver Children's Hospital. The family was notified and came in a little bit later. The doctors met with the family and said, she's still alive, but it will take a miracle for her to survive the night. They're already dealing with the loss of a spouse, with a wife, with a mother. And here they are threatened with losing a daughter as well. And the husband grabs his cell phone and he begins to pray. And he begins to send out messages asking for prayer for his daughter. And people take those voicemails and those messages, those text messages, and they blast, per, they blast, they blast cries for help out all over social media, asking people to pray for Charlie's life in the power of Jesus' name. And that night, Charlie made it. Charlie survived. God gave her a miracle. When the doctors reviewed her CAT scan, they were encouraged because there were signs of improvement, but they cautioned the family, I don't know that she'll ever walk again, and I would not expect Charlie to ever talk again. They had the best medical treatment available, and they were grateful for it. But not in spite of, but in addition to that help, they just said, let's pray. And the saints gathered in Jesus' name, and they prayed in Jesus' name for a miracle for Charlie. This past week, Jesse Florquist, he's the uncle of Charlie, who's a longtime member, longtime friend here at Highland Park Community Church, sent me this text message because we've been praying for her. And I want you to see Charlie. Check it out. We have to crawl. Close to Charlie. Oh. Oh, there he goes. Oh, good job, Charlie. Good job, girl. Can you say it one more time? What? Yeah. We got a license for that? Yourself with that spoon is not a problem. That was four weeks ago. I don't pretend to know, and I wouldn't even dare attempt to explain why God chooses to answer some prayers that way and why he chooses to answer other prayers differently. But the fact of the matter is there is no limit to his power. And we can rest in the truth in the fact that there is no limit to his power, but we can also rest in the truth in the fact that he is always working things out for what is best for us. And sometimes what's best for us doesn't always feel good. But we can trust that he's always working for our good and for his glory. And so whatever it is that you're facing, understand this, that that is a miracle. That is a miracle of God, 
not by the words of the saints, but in the prayers of the saints, whose prayers are grounded in the one who's no, li- there is no limit to his power. And what I would say again is church, stop looking. If you're looking at your prayers like they're wimpy, they're not. They're going up to the King of kings and the Lord of lords who has established his throne forevermore. And he hears and he knows and he's working. So don't give up. Don't give in. Understand when you pray, God hears and he knows and that prayer is powerful and that prayer is effective. And he will bring it about for his glory in his best timing and in the way that is best for his kingdom. So let me give you four enemies of praying powerful and effective prayers. The first one is apathy. Apathy is this. Apathy will keep you from praying powerful and effective prayers. Apathy is just a lack of concern. You're not concerned. There's no energy. You're just like, whatever. I don't care. And you might think, I would never feel that way towards God. Oh, what happens? I can tell you an accountant, 1 Kings. There was a man named Elijah. He was the one lone prophet of God left in the kingdom of Israel. All of Israel, all of Israel, who God had brought out of Egypt into the promised land, had conquered all the enemies, had left God for this little statue, we'll call him the little bee, named Baal. And they worshiped this idol instead of God. And so Elijah calls this meeting, he goes and grabs King Ahab, and he goes and he grabs his his wicked queen Jezebel and the entire nation. They meet on top of this mountain called Mount Carmel, and Elijah says, today, here's what's going to happen. We're going to figure out who the one true God is. Hey, we're going to pray. You can pray to Baal, and I'm going to pray to God, and whichever God answers by fire from the sky and consumes this altar, that is God, and we're going to worship him. And do you know what the response was? It wasn't like, whoo, can't wait to see who answers. It was. All right, whatever. Completely unconcerned. Let me tell you this. The enemy doesn't have to make your life miserable to make your prayers ineffective. Let me say that again. The enemy doesn't need to make your life miserable to make your prayers ineffective. He just needs to create conditions where you're apathetic. Because apathy leads to ineffective prayers because there's just no energy, there's no motivation for it. Well, that day, you know, and you can read for yourself, man, they prayed like crazy to the little bee, and he never answered. But in one prayer, a powerful and effective prayer, Elijah steps up and says, hey, God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, show these people who you are today. And fire rained down from the sky, revealing who he was. Powerful and effective prayer. Listen, if you've got apathy going on in your life today, It could be because of idols that exist in your life. It could be because of idols that you have in your life. If you look at that story, it was idolatry that led to apathy. We got so much stuff. We love so much stuff. There are times that we put that stuff in front of God, and that is the perfect condition for the enemy to create apathy towards God, and that's going to lead to ineffective prayers. And when the church stops praying... The devil doesn't have to worry about us. He's not concerned because we don't care. We should care. But idolatry isn't the only thing that leads to apathy. Pace of life leads to apathy. Some of you guys are running a pace of life that you cannot sustain. And I know that pace of life can be seasonal, okay? There might be seasons that we've just got to just get after. I get it. But it should be really short bursts because if you try to run that sustained pace of life for very long, you're going to get tired. And you could continue to pray, you could continue to read, but at that point you're just going through the motions. And before you know it, you wind up in the land of apathy, but it's, it's, not just, it's, not just, it's not just idolatry and it's not just um, pace of life. Sometimes because of genetics, because of stuff and circumstances in our life, sometimes it's just seasonal, we wind up with depression and we just find ourselves in the land of apathy. I know what that seasonal depression is like. It's from a, it's from a crazy pace of life. Apathy will poison 
our prayers. It's an enemy of. Let me give you another one. It's a big one. The consumer mindset. Did you know, and again, this is not a bully pulpit. This is not a soapbox. This is just speaking in pure fact. There is nothing emotional about what I'm about to say. Did you know that we as Americans, we as Americans, spent $1 trillion on ourselves this past holiday season? A trillion dollars. In America alone, we spent $1 trillion on ourselves. And I would love to tell you, we just consume, 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 consume. And I would love to tell you that consuming is just tied to our shopping habits. It's not. It's also tied to our faith, where we come in and we consume, consume, consume. We learn, we receive, we receive, but we never do anything with it. Mark Batterson, I love what he says, the author of The Circle Maker. He just simply says, you know, he goes, we, have, we are more educated than the early church ever was. And yet we are more under, it's not that we're under-resourced. It's just we're underutilized. Like we're not stepping into and leveraging our faith. Now there's another great theologian out there. His name is Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> you know the guy who says you might be a redneck if. You might be a consumer if you show up to church, but you miss out on being the church. Meaning you show up, but you rarely, if ever, benefit the body of Christ. You guys, when we become consumers in our faith, we make, it, we make our faith about us and not about the kingdom of God. And that won't lead to powerful and effective prayers because we make it all about us. Let me give you another one. Religion. Who did Jesus have the most problems with? The religious leaders. Do you know sometimes we can go to church so much, I know that they get a bad rap. Listen, these guys had a lot of great knowledge about who God was, but it was all up here and it never got here. They're just super religious. I remember there's this, there's this encounter that Jesus has with a rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, how can I, in, how can I inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, observe and live in the Ten Commandments. And the guy goes, yippee, yee-haw, I can do it. I've been doing that since I've been a little boy. And Jesus says, that's awesome. Then there's just one more thing that you need to do. He says, what's that? He says, I want you to go and sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And the man walked away heartbroken because he was wealthy and he couldn't do it. Let me tell you why that guy couldn't do it. Because he had just enough religion to feel good about himself. Jesus, I've kept the Ten Commandments. I'm really good over here. And Jesus says, great, go and give everything you have to the poor and come follow me. And he walked away, couldn't do it. He missed out on the kingdom of God. He missed out on Jesus. The point being, there are some of us in here today who have just enough Jesus to feel good about ourselves. We've prayed the prayer. We can check the attendance box. We can check this box, we can check that box, and we feel good about us. But we're completely missing out on Jesus and what it means to be his follower, which is to love others. Again, not to uh, kick a dead horse, but in the famous words of the theologian Jeff Foxworthy, you might be religious if you value tradition over transformation. The way I do it, this way, that way, over people being transformed by Jesus' name. You might be religious if that's the case, but I've got one more and I don't want to miss it. Because it was a good one. <laughs> there you go. You might be religious if you have a critical spirit, if you're more prone to judge than love, you might be religious. All right, fourth one, discord. Fourth one is discord. Discord is just an interruption. That's what it is. 
Well, okay, so if there's discord with God, if there's an interruption because of our sin condition, if we're a follower of his who he's made righteous, but yet we're sinning and we're sinning intentionally, listen, that's going to disrupt, create discord with God. Plain and simple. And if we've got discord with God, our prayers aren't going to be powerful and effective, except for the one that turns back to him. But if we love God, but we are not, in, and if we love God and we've got harmony with him, but we don't have harmony with our brothers and we're for, or sisters and we are purposely not forgiving somebody who has harmed us, then we have discord with man. And that will keep us from praying powerful and effective prayers. So these four things right here are enemies of powerful and effective prayers. Let me give you the solution to those, those four things and I'll do it much quicker than what I went through those. The first one is if apathy is the enemy, then passion can be the catalyst. Oftentimes we look at passion as a personality, is man, that person's got charisma, man. They've got great charisma. We follow that person. See, passion has nothing to do with being charismatic. It has everything to do with energy. And if there's no energy, well, then we're going to have apathy. But if there's energy, then we can have passion for, and that God would give us passion for prayer. That God would give us passion for bringing his kingdom to people who need to know it through Jesus' conversations. You guys, if you're lacking passion this morning because you have apathy, here's what I would tell you. Maybe it's time to just give some stuff away. Maybe it's time to go through your stuff and give some stuff away. Because maybe your apathy is tied to idolatry. But maybe your apathy, maybe your lack of passion is because of your pace of life. And today what I want to do is I want to give you freedom to stop. To stop doing something. Stop that pace of life. Mike, I can't. What I would tell you is you can't afford not to. Your health, your relationship with God, your relationship with people is way more important than whatever it is you're doing. So if you are running a pace of life that is leading to apathy, that is robbing you of passion, slow down and rest so that energy level can come back up and replace that apathy. And as you do that, pray. Maybe today what you need to do it's because that pace of life is so crazy. Just go do something that you love to do. Something that will breathe energy back into you. If you go and you live in a hobby that you love to do, and it brings absolutely zero energy or thrill or excitement to you, that should tell you, that's a telltale warning sign. Something's not right, and you need to slow down and stop doing something so you can get that passion, that energy back. All right. If you are a consumer... If you struggle with consumerism, and here's what I would tell you. If you struggle with any of these, and I bet if you struggle with one, you struggle with several. Congratulations. You're human. You're human. It happens. Okay? But there is, there is remedies, and passion is that for apathy. Here's the second one. If you're a consumer, become a contributor. Serve somewhere. That's a great way to spark your faith. The next thing to do, become a contributor. There is an entire ministry devoted to contributing out there. And my favorite part about it, the reason it exists, is not for us to tell you what you should do. See, God, when he made you, has got plans for you. We want to partner with him in what he placed inside of you, and we want to partner with you to discover what that is and say, become a contributor. When we contribute, our faith level goes up, our energy level goes up, and it takes real hard work, but it will kill, it will kill the consumer that lives inside of all of us. Contributing will kill the consumer that lives inside of us, and it will lead to powerful and effective prayers. If you struggle being religious, you're more religious Pursue a relationship with God. You can't pursue a relationship and really know God and not love him and love others. He, his love that he pours into you will help us love others. Even those we have a hard time loving. A relationship with God, being made right with God, leads to powerful and effective pr prayers. And if there's discord this morning, Harmony is the solution. Let me give you two ways to have harmony. 
the first one is spelled repentance. If there's discord with God, we want harmony with God. How do we have that? Repentance. Lord, forgive me of my sins. It is turning from our wickedness and turning to him. That, Lord, forgive me. I screwed up. That is a powerful and effective prayer that sets you free and brings you back into a right relationship with God. That is a prayer that some of us need to be praying today. How else do you spell harmony? You spell it forgiveness. Some of you, some of us, need to forgive somebody in our life. We've been holding a grudge. And I'm reminded of what Jesus says. Jesus says, if you go to the altar to pray, if you go to your bedroom to pray, if you go, if you're driving and you go to pray, and the Spirit reminds you of discord with your brother or sister, go to that person and try to make it right, and then come back and pray. It's that big of a deal. But one who has harmony with God and has harmony with people, powerful and effective prayers. Turn to your Bibles, and I'm going to close with this because I'm going to give you a prayer that I want you to pray. It's a prayer for the church. It was actually in our journal this week. It was in our journal if you're going along with us in community groups or if you grab that journal. If you haven't grabbed that journal, please go ahead and grab it. You can jump in with us. But it's a prayer that Paul prays for the church. You see, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. In one of the groups, one of the places the prayer gets overlooked the most is for the people sitting next to us. Look at the prayer that Paul prayed for, for the church in Colossae. For this very reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. That is a prayer we need to be praying for one another all week long. So that we might live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in everything that we do. Oh, that we would pray for one another, that we would be praying all week long for one another, that each and every one of us, 100% of us, would live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Well, catch this, bearing fruit in every good work and while growing in the knowledge of God. That is a powerful and effective prayer. Paul prayed that prayer for the church at Colossae and it went all the way around the world. It's impacting us today that we would pray prayers like that. Being strengthened, that the church would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that we might have great endurance and patience. What a powerful and effective prayer that God has given us through his servant Paul that we can pray for one another. For Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Lord God, that we would be a people of prayer who pray powerful and effective prayers like this, not just for one another, but for your church around the world, to your glory and your name forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, have a fantastic week, everybody. Next week we're going to finish this thing up.